Train, Chattanooga Choo Choo, Casey Jones, Wilson Prison Blues. American culture is full of references to the railroad. What is it about trains that is so important to the United States? the biggest railway network in the world. Carrying freight, supplying the biggest economy in the world. Using the biggest trains in the world. Because this, they reckon, is almost the biggest country in the world. The United States of America are over 2,000 miles wide. They have mighty deserts and prairies and huge mountain ranges. And the Americans built the first transcontinental railways by hand. They are the United States Great Wall of China, their pyramids, their Roman aqueducts. Before the railroad, there are only two ways to get from coast to coast in the United States of America. You could cross over the Great American Desert by wagon train, over prairies, mountains and rivers, or well, you went south by boat round Cape Horn. So, not many takers then. Not until the discovery of gold, that is. When in 1849, over 50,000 headed overland to the gold fields of California. It was like crossing to the other side of the world. Many lost their lives en route. What they needed was a railroad. Surveys and explorations to find a way across the Great American Desert had begun in 1854. But the biggest barrier to a transcontinental railroad was the Sierra Nevada Mountains, a huge range, 400 miles long, 80 miles wide, rising to 14,000 feet. One railway engineer was determined to find a way through these mountains. His name was Theodore Judah. He already had one Californian railroad to his name, and this was a challenge he couldn't resist. Having made over 20 trips on horseback, some with his wife, some on his own, painstakingly trying to find a way through the mountains, surveying every possible route, Judah eventually found one, using a series of ridges over the notorious Donner Pass at 7,000 feet. The Donner Pass was notorious in Western folklore because a party of settlers had perished there and had overwintered some of them resorting to cannibalism. <laughs> Triumphant in his discovery, Judah was able to persuade Californians to back his scheme. And as the official representative of the newly formed Central Pacific Railroad Company, he went off to Washington to seek the support of President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was in the middle of fighting the Civil War and knew how valuable the railroads were in moving men and arms. And could also see that a nationwide railroad could reunite the Union after the war. He gave the idea his backing. In 1862, the Pacific Railroad Act was passed, allowing two companies, one from the West, the Central Pacific, and one from the East, the Union Pacific Railroad to build railroads that would meet in the middle of the continent, a transcontinental railroad. Judah returned to California. Now it was time to get to work. And back in Sacramento were the men who would pay the bills. Four hard-headed merchants. The big four investors, as they came to be known, were Mark Hopkins, a hardware store owner, and his partner, Collis P. Huntington. Between them, they had the biggest hardware business in the Southwest. Leland Stamford, a grocer, who also had a huge wholesale business and was running for governor. And Charles Crocker, a dry goods merchant. They were all members of a newly formed political party, the Republican Party. And they knew the railroads would make them very rich and very, very politically powerful. It was a license to print money. 
For every mile of track completed, the government gave the railroad companies 6,400 acres of land. And of course that land, with the prospect of new trading towns, immediately shot up in value. Plus, the companies were given government grants to build the track itself. $16,000 per mile on level ground, $32,000 per mile when there was an incline, and rising to the unspeakably staggering sum of $48,000 per mile when they were in the mountains. Both the Central Pacific, building from west to east, and the Union Pacific, building from east to west, found numerous ways of embezzling money from the government and raising the value of the land they were going to build over. Durant, the chairman of the Union Pacific, had a brilliant tactic. He would buy land, announce that the route would pass over that land, and when it tripled in value, he would sell it and announce a different route. <laughs> Finally, when all pockets had been well and truly lined, work on the Union Pacific started here, the Council Bluffs in Iowa, in 1863. Ahead lay the empty plains of Nebraska, which should have been easy going, but progress at first was slow due to incompetence. In 1863. the West, Judah, having seen his dream descend into a pit of greed, in substandard workmanship, sold his shares and left the company. The Big Four carried on without him. The Central Pacific Railroad broke ground first here, Sacramento, on the banks of the River Sacramento. It was a horrible, wet January day, the 8th, in 1863, with the Civil War raging all around. The ground was so wet that a cartload of dry earth had to be brought in to perform the ceremony. Not a very auspicious beginning. Stanford addressed the crowd grandly, talking about binding the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean with iron ties. Glasses were raised in optimistic toasts, but it was a huge, daunting project. And already, people were sounding warning notes. A local newspaper said, underlying all the enthusiasm, there was a fear that it was a farce and not a fact which was being inaugurated. Farce or not, the world's biggest civil engineering project had begun. It's very comfortable here in the dining car of the Zephyr. And it's very scenic out there. But imagine working outside in conditions like these, labouring on the US Transcontinental Railroad wasn't exactly a job people were queuing up for. Charles Crocker, grocer turned general railway superintendent, constantly signed up labour to find that the first mention of gold or silver, they disappeared. Men had come west to get rich, not to labour on railroads. The mammoth task of building a track over and through the Sierra Nevada mountains was grinding to a halt. And then Crocker had a stroke of genius. He started to employ Chinese labour, bringing them all the way across the Pacific. They were amazingly dedicated and tenacious workers. Eventually, 10,000 of them were employed, over 95% of the workforce. Yet even with the amazingly tenacious Chinese carving and blasting their way through the solid granite, progress was often just a few feet a day. Bitter winters brought blinding snow. Half the workforce were employed just clearing drifts. Some of the Chinese workforce had never seen snow before, but they had fantastic endurance. Miles and miles of snow galleries were built over the track out of wood to protect from avalanches. And sometimes, especially in the terrible winters of 1868 and 1867, when there was over 40 foot of snow up here in the Sierra Nevada, they had to hollow out tunnels in the snow in order to crawl to work to begin work on the line. Plus, there was a huge amount of blasting to be done with the tunnels around difficult parts of the track. 
In order to speed the blasting work, they would lower men in wicker baskets down to the blasting face. Then they would drill holes, tamp in the explosives, light the fuses and be hauled up. Some of them, of course, didn't make it, despite their baskets being decorated with Chinese good luck symbols. It was estimated that 10 tonnes of Chinese bones were shipped home for burial. But after all their sacrifices to build the Transcontinental Railroad, the Chinese weren't even given American citizenship. Human rights didn't stand in the way of this railroad, oh no. In the East, the Native Americans were being brutally dispossessed of their land. The current attitude was best summed up by General Sherman, who was responsible for the security of the railroad teams. The more we kill this year, the less we have to kill in the next war. The more I see of Indians, the more I am convinced that we will have to kill them all, or that they be maintained as a species of pauper. By 1866, the Central Pacific had only built 100 miles of track, but there were 6,000 feet up in the mountains. And they were building 15 tunnels, the longest of which, Summit Tunnel, was 1,659 feet long. It was built by two teams of men hacking and blasting their way to each other using pickaxes and black powder. When they finally met, despite endless curves and inclines, they were only two inches out of alignment. Despite their impressive engineering achievements, the Central Pacific was losing out to its rivals. The Union Pacific was racing across Wyoming and on into Utah, laying track and gobbling up land grants, while the Central Pacific was stuck in the mountains. If they were to get their share of the goodies, they needed to start building on the other side of the mountains, on the flat bit. The first locomotives across the Sierra Nevada didn't go under their own steam, they were carried. In the winter of 1867, work was held up by snow, but Crocker was determined that the Union Pacific wouldn't keep building towards them while they were stuck. So he took 3,000 Chinese laborers, dismantled three locos and 40 wagons and carried them over. It was the greatest mountain crossing since Hannibal. Having climbed over 8,000 feet and broken through 15 tunnels, the Central Pacific finally conquered the mountains. It was downhill all the way now, and the race was hotting up. The workers were instructed to work on as if heaven were before you and hell behind. As the companies raced towards each other, literally, they took bets as to who could lay the most track in a day. And on April the 28th, 1869, the Central Pacific won the bet of $10,000. That was the length of one piece of rail. They laid 10 miles of track in one day. Eight Irish labourers took care of the rails, putting them into position after the Chinese labourers had put down the ties, the sleepers. By 1869, both companies had reached the flatlands of Utah and were building track towards each other at a furious pace. Desperate to maximise the money they made from land grants, they just continued past each other for 250 miles. So you had the absurd position of having the Central Pacific's track bed here and the Union Pacific's track bed here. Bonkers! with two sets of crews working furiously alongside each other and in bitter rivalry, there were bound to be problems. What didn't help is the presence of a lot of gunpowder. You can still see the drill holes here. The powder was pushed in, tamped down and exploded and brought the rock down. The crews had a lot of fights. It only ended 
when a Chinese crew buried an Irish crew, a truce was called. Finally, Congress told them to pack it in into a range of meeting point, and they decided on this place, Promontory Summit, Utah, a wild and barren place. The occasion was marked by the driving of golden spikes. The chairman of each company each had a sledgehammer, a maul, the Americans called it, wound round with telegraph wire, because now the telegraph which had accompanied the railroad east and west extended from coast to coast. And as they hammered in their spikes, the message flashed from coast to coast. Done! Cue huge celebrations. The most ambitious railway in the world had united the States of America. A week later, the first coast-to-coast -coast trip was successfully made. Passenger coaches being pulled by the very engines that had helped in the building of the track. If you had to describe a 19th century American railroad loco, this would be it. Number one, Governor Stanford. First locomotive built for the Central Pacific Railroad and used in its construction. It has all the hallmarks of an American wood-burning loco, designed to run on roughly laid track. The four-wheel truck at the front was what really defined the look of these locos, and it was essential for coping with the rough track giving guidance and providing attraction to haul the trains over the mountains. These familiar huge balloon stacks that are so different to European loco design prevented stray sparks starting prairie fires. Big lamps enabled fast nighttime running and these great cow catchers seen in every Wild West movie were really there to prevent buffaloes derailing the train. It soon became the absolute standard design for American 440. And the American 440 dominated American locomotive design for 50 years. So the locos were brilliantly adapted to cope with the wild territory. But like all steam engines, the one thing they weren't very good at coping with was steep inclines. And in the Sierra Nevada, those inclines often stretch for over 15 miles. All they could do was hitch up two or more locos together to slog their way up. I have to admit, when I was a kid, and he used to see American trains double-headed with huge locos, I used to think they were showing off a bit. But when you see these inclines, mile after mile after mile after mile, that make the British inclines look puny, you realise that they earn their keep. By the 1930s, William Jeffers, president of the Union Pacific, had had enough of using more than one engine. He decided it was time to build a much more powerful power unit. He wanted to build a grown-up locomotive that could cope on its own. His designers came up with this, the Challenger class, the largest and most powerful steam locomotive of its day. So, no more problems with hills then. A fully loaded Challenger weighs 250 tonnes. The tender, five times bigger than the biggest in Europe, carries 25,000 gallons of water. It burns fuel so quickly that no human stoker could keep up with its voracious appetite. A mechanical coal feed had to be invented. Like the early 440s, this engine uses trucks for articulation. It needs to. It's 60 feet long. The 4664 configuration allows it to cope with tighter curves than a rigid frame European locomotive, and it means 
it can carry a huge boiler, plenty of power. This beast was designed to pull freight and plenty of it. Today, number 3985 doesn't have to work so hard. She's enjoying a graceful and well-earned retirement. A lucky few with money to burn can now enjoy her unique style and savour a little of the great endeavour that united America. President Kennedy put it rather well in 1963. It was the railroad that carried the great tide of Americans to areas of new opportunity and hope. It was the railroads that linked the diverse segments of this vast land so that together they could create the greatest economy the world has ever known. Nowadays, most Americans fly or use the interstate highways. They travel by plane, car and truck, but the transcontinental railroad is still vital to the economy of America. Possibly the most mournful sound in the world, an American freight train, triple-headed, three diesels, big country, big trains. Thousands of railway workers that toiled and laboured in adverse conditions made America the richest country on earth. It was the railroad that made America great. Derailed. Sorry, Don, I broke your handcart. <laughs> 